Hey, this is Dan Harris. I am a fidgety, skeptical newsman who had a panic attack live on Good Morning America. That led me to something I always thought was ridiculous. Meditation. I wrote a book about it called 10% Happier, started an app, and now I'm launching this podcast to try to figure out whether there's anything beyond 10%. Basically, here's what I'm obsessed with. Can you be an ambitious person and still strive for enlightenment, whatever that means? Hey, it's Dan, uh, our guest today, or my guest today, I guess I can say it's my guest today, because this is kind of like my show, um, is Brian Koppelman. He is the co-creator of the new show on Showtime called Billions, which is a great show. If you're not watching it, you should be. Uh, he, he's also written a bunch of movies like Rounders, which is a cult classic, Ocean's 13, Runner Runner. He's also, and this is important given the context, a meditator, uh, and meditation shows up really prominently in Billions where in the first episode you see two of the main characters. One is a hedge fund billionaire, and the other is the U.S. attorneys uh, out to get him. Both of them meditate. Uh, so, Brian, thanks for coming in. Hey, Appreciate it's it. It's my, my real pleasure to be here, man. I just met you a couple minutes ago. I already really like you. Yeah, we're like best we, friends. We could it's be friends. Right. Yeah, we perfect. actually could be friends. Well, you have the same drum kit that I, I can't have. <laughs> <laughs> there is. So we're in my office. I should have said that at the beginning. We're in my office, which is the first time we're doing um, a podcast in my office, and I have an electronic drum kit the lame that that makes me look seventy five thousand times cooler than I actually am because the truth is I've never played it because until today it was blocked off by like boxes and pictures which in 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 anticipation of your arrival we actually hung up the pictures. I just love the idea that you have it because it says something about exactly the right kind of aspiration for how you want to spend your day. Like mm-hmm. even if you never can, the idea that it's possible that you could put the headphones on crank up uh, Back in Black and try to play it <laughs> in your office at ABC News is awesome. But doesn't it, doesn't it kind of suggest that I'm, like, really not into actually working? No, it's the right kind of silly, right? For a meditator, it's the right kind of silliness. It's, I think, the sort of Dada spirit of that is really a good thing. And, uh, no, I think um, there's no question that you need uh, in any kind of hard endeavor that requires a certain kind of focused creativity – the uh, opportunity to blow off the exact kind of steam that playing the drums allows you to blow off uh, is probably should be required. It shouldn't be something you have to uh, excuse. I just love that you just added a sheen to my distractedness and laziness. Um, so l- let's talk about meditation because you brought it up and because this whole show is about meditation. Um, you, As I said, the two main characters right in the pilot are, are seen meditating. One is a, a hedge fund guy and the other is a U.S. attorney. Why did you have your characters do this? I mean... It, you know, for a, a few different reasons. Um, story-wise and character-wise, it, it makes sense because as you do even a little research into the world of um, high-performance uh, New York, Greenwich, Westport people, um, you find that they're chasing uh, – they're, they're chasing, if, if, if not inner peace, they're chasing a kind of uh, actualization as performance enhancement. And one of the the key things that they seem to look to is meditation. So that from it fits the world, and it's true to the world. Dave and I are, are David Levine is my creative partner. Uh, he and I um, b- both practice transcendental meditation, and so does and Andrew Ross Sorkin. Andrew Ross Sorkin is a third, third co-creator as well. Um, he also does meditation, though. Um, maybe we have to ask him how, how what he's told me is. it's TM. I thought, yeah, I thought he, uh, it yeah, he does TM or he certainly has done TM. Uh, and, um, so w- and we have found tremendous benefit, uh, in it and, um, f- would go to events in New York occasionally, watch people speak, look at the ways in which people are using meditation now. And, um, you know, there was this idea that, uh, or there is an idea people carry around that, It'll necessarily make you a kinder person or a gentler person or um, a more giving person. I mean, in fact, they don't even promise in TM. They make none of those promises. That'll make you more of the best of what you are is what they promise, which seems like an idea really um, that really fits the hedge fund world and the world of prosecutors who – um, are driven by the kind of ambition that our characters are, are driven by. So there, I want to talk uh, uh, at length about what meditation does for you, but there are a lot of people, and I hear from them, who uh, are critics of the growing popularization slash commercialization of meditation. And the idea that uh, masters of the universe uh, 
and people who are complete jerks would be using meditation not to make themselves better, uh, kinder people, but to make themselves better at what they already are. For example, your U.S. attorney character, played by Paul Giamatti, you see him meditating, and in the next scene, he threatens to put his father in handcuffs and arrest him. So this the, this is not making him a kinder person unless his baseline is incredibly low. Um, so do, what is your thought about— Well, he does say, I love you, Dad. He does. He does. <laughs> he right does before say, he threatens. right before he threatens him, <laughs> I love you, Dad. So, I'm not sure that's a mitigating uh, uh, mitigating detail. But do you th- do you have any problem as a guy who meditates with people using— meditation just to make themselves more effective even if they're going to be well, bad should, actors in the world how should they use it well i mean we say i'm not, I'm not comfortable with anyone using uh anything to be a, a bad actor in, in the world right but um i mean someone could decide to drink uh eight, you know eight cans of coca-cola and go get all hopped up and do something uh bad but um look meditation is a tool so and it's a really effective tool uh and so someone's going to use that tool uh to be more to me to be more of what the, they are to help them in their own aims. Now, is it possible that if you really pursue meditation and you are doing TM, so you're doing it 40 minutes a day, that perhaps some uh, uh, thoughts or some feelings of calmness or that your cortisol levels will adjust to a place where um, you're just naturally uh, a, hair, a little less hair trigger? Yeah, could that be nicer for the people around you? Yes. But I don't have um, – I don't think that there's a value, positive or negative, in terms of societal good to any of these things. There's not a societal value to yoga versus uh, uh, doing sprints or Tabata, right? It just has certain accoutre- Eastern accoutrement that makes a, make us think uh, that it must be uh, more uh, uh, peaceful s- somehow. I don't necessarily think that that's, that that's the case. Uh, the, look – there's philosophy you could read alongside a meditation if you want. There are a ton of other things you can do. But what I've found it to do for many people is just make them more what they are. So I w- or truer, like a more distilled version. It's possible that I disagree with you. But, but I want to think out loud. I want to understand how. Yes. Teach, okay, tell so me. I'm not, tell me. Sh- I'm not sure. So let me think out loud. But before I think out loud, I think it might be useful to define terms because so you're talking about transcendental meditation which is the type of type of meditation you do and just just for the uninitiated i should explain that transcendental meditation is derived from hinduism and it was popular basically invented if you want to use that word by the maharishi mahesh yogi who, that may that name may be familiar to some of our listeners slash viewers because he was the guy who was for a brief period of time the spiritual guru to uh, a reasonably well-known rock band known as the beatles uh and so he kind of rocketed to global uh fame as a consequence of that so he was te- he was teaching transcendental meditation, uh, which again is a, basically a form of Hindu meditation, which uses a mantra, which is a silent word you repeat to yourself. And as you repeat this word to yourself, often in conjunction with your breath, you can achieve this level of concentrative absorption that allows you to shut out the discursive thinking mind and can put you in touch with. Uh, sort of levels of calm and even bliss and maybe even creativity that heretofore were unavailable. You know, you're not chasing bliss in TM um, as you're meditating, right? One of the, one of the sort of central um, tenets of uh, TM is that what happens in that 20-minute period, ha- ha- the way in which you perceive what happens doesn't really matter. So that I am not looking for a blissful state. All I'm looking to do is say that mantra to myself. And if thoughts come, I can they they can exist, and then they'll move past. And uh, I just keep saying the mantra. But what happened to me? And I'm not a spokesman for TM. I'm an first of all, I'm an atheist, and I'm like a hardcore atheist. And one of the first things I said when I went to talk about learning this was um, that the cult-like aspects of any organized meditative group. Uh, freak me out uh you know but you don't have to believe in any sort of uh ideas that came from uh hinduism you don't have to uh believe that the maharishi had uh, tapped into some mystical thing at all but he you can look at the science the e, you can look at the eegs you can look at the scientific studies that show what happens to cortisol levels when people do this. Or blood pressure. Uh, blood pressure, cortisol levels, mm-hmm. heart rate, all these things that, that just happen 
and you know the controlled studies i mean i know you've gone through this stuff but uh you know if you just sit quietly for 20 minutes there's some benefit to that and breathe but if you sit quietly and repeat the mantra and there are more uh tangible benefits that are greater than if you don't and for, for me it was a salve for uh and a way to control anxiety uh and um I found that the physical manifestations of anxiety just uh, dissipated by about 85 or 90 percent. That's phenomenal. That's great. And it, so that was a gigantic life change uh, to not get uh, feel a fluttering stomach, to not get a uh, stress uh, headache. Were to, you a like Were that. you a G- JIA Jew in agony? That's pretty good. Um, uh, well, I'm an atheist, but I am a Jew. I mean, I guess I, I was raised Jewish. Um, and culturally, I, I didn't make that term up. Was some, some of my Hebrew school friends? When no, I guess when uh, when a fascistic leader comes to power and decides to kill the Jews, he'll kill me, whether I identify as Jew or not. Fair so enough. yes, I, I guess uh, by that definition, I am. No, you know wh- whatever the anxieties are, being someone trying to make a living uh, in show business, or more to the point, like a, a parent who loves his kids, any kind of outsized worry that I might have, um, it doesn't mean I don't still have concerns right or i don't still worry as we all do i don't still uh, i'm not still aware of uh, the um you know thin uh, existential situation we all find ourselves in but the physical manifestations the actual sort of way that i walk through the world and feel changed a dramatic amount when i started meditating after probably three weeks of uh, meditating so just back to the sort of clarification of terms when i described tm i've never really done tm so when i described it did i describe it more or less accurately yeah 20 minutes you 20 minutes twice a day the, as soon as you wake up in the morning and then at some point in the afternoon before dinner um you i sit quietly close my eyes and uh repeat a mantra for about 20 minutes and so the difference in this this sort of goes back to what i was saying before about how maybe i disagree with you but i want to yeah. kind of talk it out um the difference is that the kind of meditation I practice is called mindfulness meditation, which is derived not from Hinduism, but from Buddhism. Um, and actually, f- to be honest with you, um, I'm, I'm a Buddhist, right? But, but, but that kind of means more and less than it, you might think. I mean, I don't view Buddhism as a religion. It is practiced as a religion by some people, but I believe in Buddhism is something to do, not something to believe in. And I, too, I, wouldn't know, I don't know if I call myself an atheist, but more like a respectful agnostic. So I don't believe in anything I can't prove. Um, although I'm willing to entertain other people's arguments on behalf of those uh, unprovable metaphysical claims. Um, So in Buddhism, in fact, the argument is that you should, uh, that there is an ethical component, but the the interesting thing about it it is not a finger-wagging ethical component. It is that if you act like uh, a jerk, we're not allowed to swear here, so they use the words I would use otherwise I can't use, but if you act like a jerk, it screws up your meditation practice because it's very hard to concentrate when you're trying to keep your lies straight or dealing with a, ma- a so large amount of So we dramatize that on the show. Um, uh, there are, there's a moment in the show a couple episodes in where Damien Lewis it's, – it's our version of, of um, uh, the king trying to, play, trying to pray in, in Hamlet, um, uh, which is not a strictly Buddhist text, but I think <laughs> has the same idea. Uh, Universal attached stuff. to it, Absolutely. right? Yes. Uh, Hamlet, and and so um, when uh, there's Damien Lewis's character Bobby Axelrod is in a particularly tight spot, um, he is trying to uh, meditate and he can't, and you see it. So y- yes, of course your your life bleeds into your meditation practice. Your meditation practice bleeds into your life. But uh, what I would what what I don't like is the fake spirituality that gets grafted on to this kind of practice. So that people, I don't uh, agree with this idea that if you meditate, you will become a better person, a more spiritual person, whatever that means. For me, it's simpler. Like the more I can reduce this stuff down and distill it, the more you can make these things simpler. It's basically breathing with some stuff attached to it. It'll probably make you feel better. If it makes you feel better, maybe it'll be nicer to people. Wouldn't that be great? Like, but... Uh, I don't think you can say it's going to make people nicer. It's like, you know what? If you have less anxiety and less – most people, given less stress, less anxiety, clearer thought, are going to act like better versions of themselves. But I don't think you can promise it. I think I would, I would agree with that like 98%. I would give that a huge amen. The only thing I would say is that 
the, there is a difference between, and I don't fully understand this because, again, I don't know enough about TM to speak about it with authority, so I want to be clear about that. But my understanding about the difference between TM and mindfulness is that mindfulness goes with extreme prejudice at mindfulness, which is lowered emotional reactivity. And while I believe there's a huge mindfulness component to, um, to TM, because every time you notice that you're thinking and you you just notice that these are just it thoughts. Makes you and you go back. It, it does makes make you, you much less reactive, uh, for Absolutely, sure. Absolutely, because you see that the voice in your head is just like a, a, just a compulsive Well, you know, liar. when they look at the EEGs, the mindfulness lights up these certain parts of the brain that are targeted towards empathy, and TM lights up a, 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 a broader area. So it includes that area, but uh, absolutely fires other things as well. Yeah, um, I, uh, many friends of mine practice mindfulness. Um, I you know, what what drew you to that practice as opposed to TM or one of the others? Uh, the science. Um, there's definitely some science around um, TM that, that appears to be quite good. I mean, look, I think, in fact, all the science around meditation needs to be delivered with a big grain of salt because it's in danger at times of being hyped um, because it's really in its early stages. But having issued that caveat, I think most of the science has really been done around mindfulness. And initially what I liked about mindfulness meditation was it is – is really thoroughly secularized, whereas TM is associated with a sectarian organization, is promulgated by the Maharishi. And so for me, as a pretty hardcore, um, uh, you know, I was raised by scientists, I'm married to a scientist, mindfulness seemed like the more interesting thing. Also, I was reading a lot about Buddhism, and I thought that the philosophy, the sort of intellectual infrastructure of Buddhism was really compelling, so I was also drawn to Buddhist meditation. Yeah. But I'm not as snobbish about it. I actually think mental exercise of whatever variety you choose, should you should do. Yeah, I just knew I needed the technology. Like I needed some access to it, and TM, I had friends who'd done it. Um, friends of mine introduced me to Bob Roth, who runs the David Lynch Foundation. I'd read David Lynch's book, really, Catching the Big Fish. And his book really spoke about the connection between um, his art and meditation in a way that was incredibly compelling. And that and a few other things, Russell Simmons' book as well. Russell, who'd lived this really big kind of crazy life, really saw huge changes and became, by his own account, a much better person mm. through TM. And I, he also had studied with Bob uh, Roth from the David Lynch Foundation. And so um, I got in a room with Bobby, and I, I asked him all these questions, you know, um, about its ties to uh, religion. And they really um, – they no longer uh, really draw that connection. They draw the connection to the – Maharishi definitely brought it to America, and they love him and regard him. But they do view it as a technology that he figured out. Right? Yeah, I, I don't know. Actually, you asked me why I was drawn to mindfulness over um, over TM. Those are the reasons why at the time, six years ago. But I don't have a yeah, dim view of the practice. I did a one meditation. You know, Tony Robbins does that thing, the one meditation that he brought over from India. I did that once with mm-hmm. Tony, and that was a really great experience too. But TM is a repeat for me. It's like a practice I can repeat. I've always – uh, Sid Arthur is one of my favorite books, mm-hmm. and the idea of the Buddhist kiss and that kind of enlightenment, because I know you're interested in this idea of enlightenment, is really compelling. It just seems like a lot to get there. <laughs> and you got to go out to the river, and I mean, there's just a lot of stuff. You it's have to be lot. hungry for a long time. It's a lot. There's a lot of stuff that has to happen. Yeah, I mean, look, I don't even t- – I'm in this weird position of being interested in pursuing something, enlightenment, that I don't even know it's, if it's real. Uh, so it's it's a kind of a funny dilemma, and yet my I, my hair is on fire with curiosity about it. Who have you met, who who you think is enlightened? I've never met anybody who cl- well, actually, I'm not asking. I have met you. I've met somebody who uh, who claims to be uh, kind of in the area of fully enlightened. Uh, I my meditation teacher, when you ask him. Are you fully enlightened? This guy named Joseph Goldstein is like a Menchie Jewish guy from here in New York, went to Columbia, joined the Peace Corps, and then ended up like in Thailand finding meditation 50 years ago, and he's been teaching it ever since. Um, he comes from a school of Buddhism where there's these four levels of enlightenment, these four experiences that you need to have before you're fully enlightened. If you ask him where are you on this spectrum, he'll say casually somewhere between the first and the third. But you didn't ask – you asked about – who do I think is actually enlightened? And I have to say that of all the human beings with whom I've ever had contact, Joseph Goldstein is the closest to being sort of 
behaviorally he, he is behavior attitude speech are all things that i emulate on my best days that i just clarity of clarity of thought cares about what he should care about yes uh, doesn't sweat the uh, stuff that he shouldn't care about yes i mean i've seen him on having bad hair days he would joke that he doesn't have that much hair um the i've you know i've seen him get you know mildly persnickety about stuff but not really that much and I just the, the the innate uncontrived integrity to the man is hard to describe, and so if, to me that gives me some confidence. Even though I'm not sure that enlightenment is real or this whole map that he's that he subscribes to is a real thing, I don't know. Yeah, as soon as you start, I mean, to me, like know. as soon as you start laying out a uh, a metric by which to measure, I'm checking out. I mean, there's something about that that feels like um, belts in karate or something. And that, uh, you know, nobody who's really good at that stuff ever talked about the moment they went from the blue belt to purple belt or something as the thing, right? The people who really can practice it were on a different kind of continuum that was only about learning and knowledge and uh, mining their abilities. So to me, um, when I've met people occasionally who seem to really have the ability to be present, because I think you, to me, I think you can really just – really take it down to can I exist right here in the present right now with my full like empathy and all my antenna out and ready to just like react listen not worry about the consequences from external forces can I be right here that's really challenging but that's the closest thing that I can imagine to the idea of that kind of enlightenment which is like to live without fear for even those little moments. And so if you can have two seconds where you're living without fear of judgment, then you have those. If you can look at somebody else and really be there, because if you can just be present, you'll do the right thing, right? Because you're not thinking about the other stuff. So then you can be really good. You can help. Um, And so there are very few people I've met who uh, really are like that. I mean, you know, there's uh, Teddy and Salinger's (laughs) short story, uh, but that's not a real person, sadly. <laughs> He's enlightened. It's good that you know that. He's enlightened. I mean, there have been times that uh, I, I haven't uh, thought so. But um, I, and, and, and it, in, to the extent that meditation allows you to string a few more of those moments of presence together, then perhaps it's a road toward that kind of enlightenment. But if you go back to Siddhartha uh, and the idea that... Um, the chasing it, right? Govinda's chasing it the whole time. Siddhartha's not chasing it. He's just following in a very present way what feels uh, like the, the thing he needs to do. And, of course, that leads him to it, and it's not something you can share other than by a kiss. And so the, by a kiss that transfers the feeling, not any kind of knowledge that, that you can gain. So... You know, for some people, it's listening to a great song or reading a book that transports them. And maybe in that like little moment that lingers after you fig- finish a great piece of art, there's a moment where you're just like right there. And maybe that's the closest to enlightened that we get to be. So whatever ladder you need to climb, like whatever that thing is, is worth trying, I think, um, as long as the the idea of trying doesn't become the thing, right? As long as we remember the goal is to not be trying. It's to just be right here. Well said, all of that. And it's also possible that there are, that there isn't a thing called enlightenment, but there are things called enlightenments. And there may be lots of different uh, experiences. You should brand and sell those things, man. I actually think you somebody really is should. selling enlightenments. You should get out there and do it. I believe my mother-in-law actually gave me them in my Christmas stocking. Um, I, I married a non-Jew. Just, um, anyway, but back to, but, but, but I, you raised something that I just want to ad- uh, address, which is you talked about your, your worry about like a map, that you wouldn't want to be part of that. So let me just play devil's advocate in defense of the map um, and the maps, because in the various – religious traditions within Buddhism, but also, I believe, within the mystical strains of, of the Abrahamic faiths, there are this sort of stepwise progression toward 
you know, you you can start with a few moments of presence and empathy, but then you can get to protracted periods of it, and then you can have it become not just a state but a trait. And and so the argument for the map is that actually you can do things, practices, and that outcomes will – there will be predictable and reliable outcomes. So the maps – to which I'm referring, don't involve, like, you have to study with this person, you have to pay X amount of dollars at this point. What they are is simply monastics over 2,600 years have found, and this I find truly fascinating, that if you sit and do the, the practice in a certain way, certain experiences will happen in your mind reliably and predictably. Again, I don't know if there's any truth to this because I haven't had these experiences, but it is fascinating to me that there's something going on apparently in the human mind as a baseline capacity that you can have these experiences if you sit and do follow the instructions. And that this has been happening for millennia is, is a really, really interesting thing, again, if it's true. Um, so I don't, I'm not referring to some sort of shoots and ladders type of thing where you have to study with X person and pay this fee and then X is revealed to yes. you. That's not really what I'm interested no, in. No, and even as a skeptic, which I am – like, I can read Tony Robbins' book, Awaken the Giant Within, and I can find the stuff in there that's useful. And I'll just – I like to look at those things as like, well, is there a discovery that someone's made about like a tool or technique that I can try? And then I'll be able to measure whether it's uh, helpful or it helps me find a direction in my life. And so I, I definitely look for that stuff. I'm more skeptical of it when it's in the religious – sphere because i i that stuff's been used to can even every religion has been used to control big groups of people i remember very vividly shopping for baby gear before our son exited the womb and uh, entered the world and it was fun but also really <laughs> stressful and it felt like i was learning a brand new language Baby List helps families celebrate with the best baby registry, ideas and inspiration for how to throw a great shower, great gifts, and digital tools that keep you and everyone you love connected. Choosing products for a growing family can be confusing. At Baby List, their expert-backed advice guides you through the process of building the perfect wish list. Their shop is deliberately curated with expert selected and real parent tested items to make it easy to figure out what's right for you and your family. I think I can speak for uh, my wife on this. I, I, I believe both of us would have loved to have had this available to us when we were about to become first-time parents. Start your registry today by visiting babylist.com. Trying to grab all the groceries in one trip? Oof, not how you would have done that. You know sometimes less is more. Like when you drive less and save with the USAA annual mileage discount. USAA. Get a quote today. I love and share your skepticism. I failed, I think, as a podcast host to do one of the primary uh, things, which is to get, get give our audience a sense of like how you became who you are. So let me, uh, let me just say a few things about your past and then let you pick it up from there. I know... That you went to Tufts, you grew up here in New York City. Your dad was I grew a, up on Long Island. Long Island, sorry. Your dad was a music executive. Yes. And when you in in college, I understand it, you actually started getting interested in, in um, uh, recruiting artists. You discovered Tracy Chapman, if I, if I have that. Correct. I did, uh, but no, it wasn't. Yeah. Um, so I started going um, to uh, the recording studio with my father when I was a very little boy. It was an incredible thing to get to do. Uh, and in fact, there's a little Easter egg in in. For my dad only in the last episode of uh, Billions, someone says that uh, Bobby Axelrod has uh, Laura Mars eyes. And my dad produced the theme song from that movie, The Eyes of Laura Mars. And so um, – and it works great because his eyes are fade on away eyes. It all worked great. People love the line. But um, – and I didn't tip it to him and I got a text from my dad saying like, I can't believe you put Laura Mars in, which was great. I remember falling uh, asleep before they started recording that on the studio couch and Jeff Skunk Baxter, one of the great musicians of all time – played this guitar solo at the end of that track and um, I was probably nine years old and I remember just sitting up and watching him do it over and over again and uh, it was a mind-blowing experience. But when, when I was in college, um, it was at the time that... Uh, so because I was around music and listening to songs all the time and an obsessed music fan, I learned um, how to figure out what was good. I, I, I learned about what made somebody a good songwriter, a good singer. I, we would talk about it all the time and I spent hours and hours listening closely. 
But then when I was in college, I was very involved in student government and um, colleges, particularly in the Northeast, uh, there was a big movement. Uh, they, the endowments were invested, uh, many of them, in companies that did business in South Africa. And this mm -hmm. is during apartheid. Mm -hmm. And so I was one of the two or three people who led the movement on my campus for divestment, uh, which was to get the uh, boards to agree to divest from these companies that were doing business in South Africa because the endowments were you know, hundreds of millions of dollars or whatever. And in doing that, I organized an all-day boycott of classes and got speakers from all over New England to come and speak. And uh, a friend of mine uh, named Peter Zizzo uh, said, there's this folk singer that I might want to go see because she might be great to play at this rally, and mm. I'd like her. And I went to see her, and it was Tracy Chapman. And um, I got... I, I broke down in tears watching her perform because my whole life had set me up to recognize what it was that she was able to do. And, I mean, she played Talking About a Revolution that night. And uh, so I got Tracy to play the rally and then spent the next two and a half years trying to get her to agree to let me record demos with her and um, to make record. And uh, then I brought her to New York and introduced her to my dad and got him to fly up. It took a long time, but that did end up becoming that first huge Tracy Chapman album. And... You then spent many years post-college, as I understand it, as an A&R a &R guy. I was an A&R right? guy in the music business. I went to law school at night. And um, and then when I turned 30, uh, I mean, we're skipping steps. But basically when I turned 30, I realized that if I, I didn't I, – I, my first child was born, our first child, Amy and my first child. And uh, I looked at my son. He was nine months old. And I, I realized that there was a big lie, which was – I was going to tell him to grow up and – chase his dreams and I realized I wasn't chasing mm. mine I realized I wanted to be an artist and that if uh, that that I if I if I didn't go out and chase it somehow if I didn't commit to it I wouldn't be able to tell him that look him really in the eye and I realized I was a block writer I'd always been a block writer for a long time and I um, I realized that uh, it, if you if you're a blocked writer um, it, it becomes toxic and that toxicity when that dream kind of dream dies that toxicity spreads and you end up I think becoming toxic to the people around you and I didn't want that I wanted to be like a great husband and a great father and so that's when my best friend and I went into a basement we agreed to meet in a basement every day and we wrote our first movie which was Rounders and the research for that movie was involved you're getting involved in, I was playing a lot of poker yeah so years of poker underground poker yeah and so how did that that fit? was all part of like the, the realization that I wasn't happy I see the realization that I wasn't living the life I was supposed to be living was uh, I found myself in my office one night, and um, I had, like, gained weight, and I had never been a cigarette smoker my entire life, and I was I was 29, and I had never been a cigarette smoker. Suddenly, I was, like, smoking, and uh, I was playing cards, like, and every opportunity I had, and I realized what the problem was. The problem was I wasn't living the life I was supposed to live. So you've, uh, got, you've gone on and built a, a, a fantastic writing career. Uh, so you said that was at 30. You're 49 now. I'm 49. So you're, you're and 19 up. years of uh, 19 years of doing this. Um, yeah, and and when when did the meditation start? So, what I did then when I was thirty, I wasn't meditating yet. I was doing something very close to it, which I still do, which is Julia Cameron's The Artist's Way, which is these I, uh, free writing for a half an hour in the morning, three longhand pages where you write anything that you want to write. You, in fact, you can't censor it. It's not what you want to write. It's just what you happen to write. And so there's something very uh, meditative about that practice because you are not censored, you're free-flowing, you're not in any way reacting to the words. Anything that comes into your head, you're putting out. And it, for, for me, it has a centering effect. And I started taking very long walks. And I, so I did those things, and that's when I read Tony Robbins' book, Awaken the Giant Within, to try to figure out uh, why I wanted to do what I wanted to do and how. And I started meditating five years ago. Um, and... Uh, because I felt like the stress and pressure of all this stuff was becoming intrusive. Uh, and um, I'm always looking for a way to, like, fine-tune whatever it is that I do as a, you know, for me as a parent and husband and then as an artist. And um, when I guess, as I say, when I read that book by David Lynch and then read Russell's book and then talked to a few other people, um, I, I had the thought that I, I should really investigate it and, and try it. Does it help with creativity, and exactly what is the mechanism by which it helps with creativity? Well, being... So, anxiety and fear, to me, are the greatest blocks to creativity that I know. Because, uh, 
for, for me, I need to be in a state where, where I feel free, uh, where I don't feel burdened, um, and um, where I don't feel the pull to the monkey mind, right? And to those where I don't feel the pull to that stuff, to reactive thinking. And so it helps because I think, you know, the science says it changes your cortisol levels and it does all this stuff to make you feel less anxious. Um, and then also there are, I've just found a few different times and you don't push for it. In fact, it's the opposite, right? You're just saying a mantra, but sometimes I'll be sitting there and like the answer will just show up or it'll show up 10 minutes later. And I mean, an answer, a huge answer to something that happens in the season finale of billions, just, you know, I did all the stuff that I always do to generate ideas. And then I remember I just sat down and closed my eyes and like this whole thing just popped into my head as I was meditating. And, um, did you stop meditating? Get up. It's funny. I asked Bob Roth the other day, what do you do? And he said, if it's really one of those ideas, you stand up and you write it down and then you come right back and meditate, get it out of your head. Why do you think TM specifically has taken off in such a big way in among celebrities and, and also like, uh, in Hollywood generally? Well, you know, Tim Ferriss, do you, I don't know if you know Tim yeah, Ferriss. Sure. I don't know He's personally. He's a friend of mine, and uh, he says that it's like 75 or over, more than 75% of, of his guests, and he, only, you know, he interviews all these incredibly high-achieving people, they do it. Do TM or meditation? Um, meditation, but m- I think a huge percentage of them do TM. First of all, it's very simple, right? The fear many people have with meditation, mindfulness, is everyone who does that kind of, most people who do your kind of meditation constantly talk about how hard it is. People who do TM constantly yeah, talk about yeah. how easy it yeah, is. Yeah, and we're not selling because I get nothing by talking about it. It's just easy. And so it's easy. And let's say for the sake of argument, let's say that you're uh, – maybe, maybe there's slightly more benefit to you than to me if you're looking at the science or whatever. Maybe mindfulness practiced every day um, p- correctly – Let's just say for the sake of it, gives you 5% more of something. I don't know that to be true. I, no, no so I don't know. even yeah. think that that's true. Yeah. But I'm saying let's say that it does. The thing is, I know I'm not doing the stuff that I'd have to do to do the mindfulness. <laughs> TM, I just have to sit down and say a mantra, and whether I can do it or not doesn't matter. All I have to do is say the mantra to myself. You can't fail at TM. The whole point of it is that you can't fail. The whole way you relax into it is to know I don't have to feel like it was a good meditation. I don't have to... Um, succeed at blocking thoughts out. I don't have to notice my breath on my upper lip. You know, I mean, I was an actor all through college, and so we did stuff that was similar to mindfulness. You did breathing stuff, and I hated all of it. TM, I love how I feel afterwards, and I love every part of doing it. It's, um, look, in our culture, I think we feel like if something's not hard, it's not worth doing, maybe. And, or how can I make gain if it's not challenging? TM is great because it's simple to do you just have to carve the time and you get results so uh i think that's why it i think that's why it catches on also you know the fact that bob roth who you've referenced a couple times is available to t you know he's he works for the david lynch foundation i've never actually met him but you should uh, have him i'm gonna have him on for sure i want to reach out to him he seems like such an interesting guy but he he makes himself available, as far as I understand it, to, to, to pretty prominent folks to teach them one-on-one. And I think, that, I think that has made a big difference. He does, and his team will. But, I mean, they're not elitist in that I've walked into the, that office and Bob is teaching somebody for free who's the furthest thing from famous. Like, yes. the whole point of the David Lynch Foundation is, I mean, he'll tell you the numbers. Again, I'm, not, I'm the furthest thing from a spokesman for any of it. They, I've taught hundreds and hundreds of thousands of inner city kids to meditate, and veterans who have, uh, post, you know, uh, um, post traumatic syndrome to to meditate. Yeah, in high schools for sure, for sure. You know, switching gears just slightly, you 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 mentioned the name Tony Robbins a couple times. Yes. Um, uh, and I know you're producing, you're involved in producing a new documentary that's going to come out about him. Yeah, Dave and I are executive producers of the documentary. Joe Berlinger, who's a great documentarian, you know, um, one of the like legendary documentarians. He made some kind of monster, and he made the uh, Metallica movie. Right? He made the Paradise Lost movies, which oh, are these right, incredibly right, important right, yeah, films yeah. Um, that were really important in figuring out who was really innocent, and who was really the West uh, Memphis Three guilty the, in the yeah. West Memphis uh, Three murders. Um, uh, Berlinger made the film. 
uh, Dave and I just introduced him to Tony. But, so what is your view? Because you, you have established yourself in the course of this interview, I think, in a sort of rock-solid way as a skeptical dude. Uh, what is your view of, of Tony Robbins? I mean, I, I, I actually – I will admit again, as I feel like I'm having to admit this a lot in this interview, that he's not somebody about whom I have an encyclopedic – Inside encyclopedic knowledge, but I know he does have his critics. So, what is your view of him? Well, we all have our critics, um, and yeah, well, uh, but but I think um, Tony has fewer and fewer qu- critics now. And I think when, if you see Berlinger's um, movie, you'll get a a really clear sense of what it is that uh, Tony Robbins does. Again, I'm not a spokesman for Tony, but I, I'm a huge fan. The walking on coals thing. Uh, yeah, well, the walking on coals thing to me is me- a metaphor, and he talks a bit about it as metaphor in his events. But that's the performance piece of what he does. Um, what works about what Tony Robbins talks about is uh, there's a. To me, he found a way to codify some questions that. Uh, are really important. It, I think the easiest way, if you watch his TED Talk, he gave a TED Talk with Al Gore in the audience um, a few years ago. That's like one of the most popular TED Talks. And uh, if you got, maybe you guys will link to it in the show notes or something. But it'll give you a really clear sense of what it is that he's interested in, which is like human beings and their why, their reason for doing the things that they do and how he can help you figure out um, uh, whether you're doing things just reactively or whether you're doing things for an actual reason. And um, I can tell you there were a few different times in my life where I read something that Tony said or I listened to something and I was able to translate into language that made sense for me and help me to get to the next level at something. Sounds like it's been... I mean, I can give you specific specific little things. They're tiny things. Um, Dave and I were trying to get a movie made called Solitary Man, um, and which uh, it was very difficult to do. it was a small, independent movie. We had Michael Douglas wanting to do it and play the lead. I'd written it. it took me four years to write it. Dave and I are going to direct it together. And we'd had this conversation um, with some uh, agents who said, oh, you'll never be able to raise the money for this. And they gave us all these like technical reasons why. And um, I happened to be listening to a thing where Tony talked about the danger of listening to people who hold themselves out as experts or smarter than you in an area if it's possible that you're smart enough to like do the research yourself read up on the thing and um, figure out, sort of uh, deconstruct their language and figure out if they the truth or not. So I was like, oh, I can do that. And so I started reading a little bit more about how foreign sales were done. And um, he talks about uh, ways to sort of remind yourself to take action every day. So I made myself a pair of Nike ID shoes that had the word solitary on them uh, written 100 times. And I wore them every day for until I got the movie greenlit. And I would look at the shoes and they would remind me to do something to move Solitary Man forward. And I called these agents one day and I said, okay, instead of you guys having those conversations, Dave and I are going to go have them. Set us up with meetings with these foreign salespeople. And they were like, they're bankers. You won't know how to talk to them. And I said, no, no, I'll know how to talk to them. Put me in the room with them. I'll get the money. We'll go make the movie. Within a week of making that call, we had the money because they realized we were going to go do it. Yes, it was hard what they had to do. But rather than be embarrassed by having us do it, they had to go out and figure out how to do it. And that was a direct result of like reading three things that the guy had said. Now, um, I don't, I'm not a fan of the walking on coal idea because I think it's possible people miss the metaphor and think it's actually dangerous. But I think that um, he's helped a lot of people, and uh, I think that the work is like um, has helped me. And I'm looking forward to watching the movie. The movie uh, was the best reviewed thing of our career. It was uh, Roger Ebert's year end best list, the New York Times year end best list. It was a small movie, an art movie, like I said, um, but we knew that it was really an important thing uh, to get made and. This really helped helped us do it. We only have a couple minutes left. In the remaining minutes, are there any other things that you wish I had asked? Any other projects you want? Or well, I mean, the only other thing about? I would say is that if people like this kind of conversation, I, I host a podcast called The Moment, uh, where uh, I have conversations with people that are similar to this about uh, the in, inflection points, what I call the inflection points in their lives, moments where um, everything w- uh, was kind of in the balance. So I'll talk to someone like Seth Meyers about what it feels like to be on the cover of uh, time and Newsweek, uh, you know, as uh, like Bruce Springsteen before him, or I'll talk to Mario Batali about the night he had an aneurysm and what that changed. Um, and so I'll talk to authors that I love, uh, musicians, and uh, really drill down about 
how uh, they found the best version of themselves. So it's also in the iTunes store. That sounds awesome. I'm going to subscribe. Please One do. last question. Yeah. I was reading something you wrote the other day about the things that you do to kind of put yourself in the in the zone. Yeah. And one and and we have a lot of things in common because you listed exercise, you listed meditation, but the other thing you mentioned, which is a little obscure, and some of our audience listeners or viewers might not know it, is you mentioned a band called The Hold Steady. Oh Love yeah, those guys. Oh, they're the, phenomenal. I, well, so that's the episode on my podcast you should start with is the episode Craig of Finn, Craig and Tad. I got both of them in there. Tad Kubler. Uh, so I've I I did a long uh, since deceased slash euthanized uh, show about indie rock uh, many years ago, um, and it was called Amplified, and I had them on, and they're incredibly nice guys, and they're also a great band. So, what's your favorite Hold Steady song that we should play out the show with? Uh, Hood Rat. Hood Red Friend. I mean, really, probably sequestered in Memphis, but um, Hood Red Friend. Hood Red Friend, because people don't know that song. It's a great song. And it's a great one. I mean, I could have said how resurrection really feels, but uh, what's yours? The Swish. Right, sure. Right from the second song, the first album. Phenomenal, phenomenal song. Almost killed me, man. The Hold Steady (laughs) almost killed me. (laughs) My friend, my new friend, thank you very much for doing this. You were a phenomenal guest. What a pleasure. Great to talk to you about this. And, uh, I'm really glad you're doing this research. Tell me what you find. Uh, (laughs) As soon as I find out. Um, Everybody watch Billions. Everybody check out the moment. Thank you again, Brian. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay, so that was Brian Koppelman, who I think I'm going to make one of my new friends. That guy's kind of awesome. Um, I want to add, and I know, sorry, this is self-promotional, so excuse me, but I want this podcast to live for a long time, and part of that is to is to uh, beg you to subscribe to it, uh, to rate it, preferably five stars. I don't want to, you know, uh, work the refs here, but five stars would be nice. Uh, and uh, to write a review. Uh, it can be just a, a short little review, anything, uh, but all of that really helps us uh, stay, uh, stay alive, which we want to do because we want to be bringing you this podcast for a long time. Uh, Thanks very much for listening. We'll be back soon with a new one. Hey, hey, Prime members. You can listen to 10% Happier early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen early and ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, do us a solid and tell us all about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey. Raising kids can be one of the greatest rewards of a parent's life. But come on, some days parenting is unbearable. I Love My Kid But is a new parenting podcast from Wondery that shares a refreshingly honest and insightful take on parenting. Hosted by myself, Megan Gailey, Chris Garcia, and Kurt Braunohler, we will be your resident not-so-expert experts. Each week, we'll share a parenting story that'll have you laughing, nodding, and thinking, oh yeah, I have absolutely been there. We'll talk about what went right and wrong. What would we do differently? And the next time you step on yet another stray Lego in the middle of the night, you'll feel less alone. So if you like to laugh with us as we talk about the hardest job in the world, listen to I Love My Kid, but wherever you get your podcasts. You can listen ad-free on the Amazon Music or Wondery app.